The Pavilion on the Links by Robert Louis Stevenson. Part 1. I was a great solitary when I was young. I made it my pride to keep aloof and suffice for my own entertainment, and I may say that I had neither friends nor acquaintances until I met that friend who became my wife and the mother of my children. With one man only was I on private terms, this was our North Amore, Esquire of Graydon Easter, in Scotland. We had met at college, and though there was not much liking between us nor even much intimacy, we were so nearly of a humour that we could associate with ease to both. Misanthropes, we believed ourselves to be, but I have thought since that we were only sulky fellows. It was scarcely a companionship, but a coexistence in unsociability. Northmore's exceptional violence of temper made it no easy affair for him to keep the peace with anyone but me, and as he respected my silent ways, and let me come and go as I pleased, I could tolerate his presence without concern. I think we called each other friends. When Northmore took his degree and I decided to leave the university without one, he invited me on a long visit to Graydon Easter, and it was thus that I first became acquainted with the scene of my adventures. The mansion house of Graydon stood in a bleak stretch of country some three miles from the shore of the German Ocean. It was as large as a barrack, and as it had been built of a soft stone, liable to consume in the eager air of the seaside, it was damp and draughty within and half ruinous without. It was impossible for two young men to lodge the comfort in such a dwelling. But there stood in the northern part of the estate, in a wilderness of links and blowing sand hills, and between a plantation and the sea, a small pavilion or belvedere of modern design, which was exactly suited to our wants, and, in this hermitage, speaking little, reading much, and rarely associating except at meals, north or more, and I spent four tempestuous winter months. I might have stayed longer, but one March night there sprung up between us a dispute, which rendered my departure necessary. Northmore spoke hotly, I remember, and I suppose I must have made some tat rejoinder. He leaped from his chair and grappled me, I had to fight without or exaggeration, for my life, and it was only with a great effort that I mastered him, for he was near as strong in body as myself, and seemed filled with the devil. The next morning, we met on our usual terms, but I judged it more delicate to withdraw, nor did he attempt to dissuade me. It was nine years before I revisited the neighborhood. I traveled at that time with a tilt cart, a tent, and a cooking stove, tramping all day beside the wagon, and at night, whenever it was possible, gypsying in a cove of the hills, or by the side of a wood. I believe I visited in this manner most of the wild and desolate regions both in England and Scotland, and, as I had neither friends nor relations, I was troubled with no correspondence, and had nothing in the nature of headquarters, unless it was the office of my solicitors, from whom I drew my income twice a year. It was a life in which I delighted, and I fully thought to have grown old upon the march, and at last died in a ditch. It was my whole business to find desolate corners, where I could camp without the fear of interruption, and hence being in another part of the same shire, I bethought me suddenly of the pavilion on the links. No thoroughfare passed within three miles of it. The nearest town, and that was but a fisher village, was at a distance of six or seven. For ten miles of length, and from a depth varying from three miles to half a mile, this belt of barren country lay along the sea. The beach, which was the natural approach, was full of quicksands. Indeed I may say there is hardly a better place of concealment in the United Kingdom. I determined to pass a week in the seawood of Graydon Easter, and making a long stage, reached it about sundown on a wild September day. The country, I have said, was mixed sand hill and links, links being a Scottish name for sand which has ceased drifting and become more or less solidly covered with turf. The pavilion stood on an even space a little behind it, the wood began in a hedge of elders huddled together by the wind, in front a few tumbled sand hills stood between it and the sea. An outcropping of rock had formed a bastion for the sand, so that there was here a promontory in the coastline between two shallow bays, and just beyond the tides the rock again cropped out and formed an islet of small dimensions but strikingly designed. The quicksands were of great extent at low water, and had an infamous reputation in the country. 
close in shore, between the islet and the promontory, it was said they would swallow a man in four minutes and a half, but there may have been little ground for this precision. The district was alive with rabbits, and haunted by gulls which made a continual piping about the pavilion. On summer days the outlook was bright and even gladsome, but at sundown in September, with a high wind, and a heavy surf rolling in close along the links, the place told of nothing but dead mariners and sea disaster. A ship beating to windward on the horizon, and a huge truncheon of wreck half buried in the sands at my feet, completed the innuendo of the scene. The pavilion, it had been built by the last proprietor, Northmore's uncle, a silly and prodigal virtuoso, presented little signs of age. It was two stories in height, Italian in design, surrounded by a patch of garden in which nothing had prospered but a few coarse flowers, and looked, with its shuttered windows, not like a house that had been deserted, but like one that had never been tenanted by man. Northmore was plainly from home, whether, as usual, sulking in the cabin of his yacht, or in one of his fitful and extravagant appearances in the world of society, I had, of course, no means of guessing. The place had an air of solitude that daunted even a solitary like myself, the wind cried in the chimneys with a strange and wailing note, and it was with a sense of escape, as if I were going indoors, that I turned away and, driving my cart before me, entered the skirts of the wood. The seaward of Graydon had been planted to shelter the cultivated fields behind, and check the encroachments of the blowing sand. As you advanced into it from coast, with elders were succeeded by other hardy shrubs, but the timber was all stunted and bushy, it led a life of conflict, the trees were accustomed to swing there all night long in fierce winter tempests, and even in early spring. The leaves were already flying, and autumn was beginning in this exposed plantation. Inland the ground rose into a little hill, which, along with the islet, served as a sailing mark for seamen. When the hill was open of the islet to the north, vessels must bear well to the eastward to clear Graydon Ness and the Graydon Bullers. In the lower ground, a streamlet ran among the trees, and, being dammed with dead leaves and clay of its own carrying, spread out every here and there, and lay in stagnant pools. One or two ruined cottages were dotted about the wood, and, according to North Amor, these were ecclesiastical foundations, and in their time had sheltered pious hermits. I found a den, or small hollow, where there was a spring of pure water, and there clearing away the brambles, I pitched the tent, and made a fire to cook my supper. My horse I picketed farther in the wood where there was a patch of sward. The banks of the den not only concealed the light of my fire, but sheltered me from the wind, which was cold as well as high. The life I was leading made me both hardy and frugal. I never drank but water, and rarely eat anything more costly than oatmeal, and I required so little sleep, that, although I rose with the peep of day, I would often lie long awake in the dark or starry watches of the night. Thus in Graydon Sea Wood, although I fell thankfully asleep by eight in the evening I was awake again before eleven with a full possession of my faculties, and no sense of drowsiness or fatigue. I rose and sat by the fire, watching the trees and clouds tumultuously tossing and fleeing overhead, and hearkening to the wind and the rollers along the shore, till at length, growing weary of inaction, I quitted the den, and strolled toward the borders of the wood. A young moon, buried in mist, gave a faint illumination to my steps, and the light grew brighter as I walked forth into the links. At the same moment, the wind, smelling salt of the open ocean and carrying particles of sand, struck me with its full force, so that I had to bow my head. When I raised it again to look about me, I was aware of a light in the pavilion. It was not stationary, but passed from one window to another, as though some one were reviewing the different apartments with a lamp or candle. I watched it for some seconds in great surprise. When I had arrived in the afternoon the house had been plainly deserted, now it was as plainly occupied. It was my first idea that a gang of thieves might have broken in and be now ransacking Northmore's cupboards, which were many and not ill-supplied. But what should bring thieves at Graydon Easter? And, again, all the shutters had been thrown open, and it would have been more in the character of such gentry to close them. I dismissed the notion, and fell back upon another. Northmore himself must have arrived, and was now airing and inspecting the pavilion. 
I have said that there was no real affection between this man and me, but, had I loved him like a brother, I was then so much more in love with solitude that I should nonetheless have shunned his company. As it was, I turned and ran for it, and it was with genuine satisfaction that I found myself safely back beside the fire. I had escaped an acquaintance, I should have one more night in comfort. In the morning, I might either slip away before Northmoor was abroad, or pay him as short a visit as I chose. But when morning came, I thought the situation so diverting that I forgot my shyness. Northmore was at my mercy, I arranged a good practical jest though I knew well that my neighbour was not the man to jest with insecurity, and, chuckling beforehand over its success, took my place among the elders at the edge of the wood whence I could command the door of the pavilion. The shutters were all once more closed, which I remember thinking odd, and the house with its white walls and green Venetians looked spruce and habitable in the morning light. Hour after hour passed, and still no sign of Northmoor. I knew him for a sluggard in the morning, but, as it drew on toward noon, I lost my patience. To say the truth, I had promised myself to break my fast in the pavilion, and hunger began to prick me sharply. It was a pity to let the opportunity go by without some cause for mirth, but the grosser appetite prevailed, and I relinquished my jest with regret, and sallied from the wood. The appearance of the house affected me, as I drew near, with disquietude. It seemed unchanged since last evening, and I had expected it, I scarce knew why, to wear some external signs of habitation. But no, the windows were all closely shuttered, the chimneys breathed no smoke, and the front door itself was closely padlocked. North Amor, therefore, had entered by the back, this was the natural, and indeed, the necessary conclusion, and you may judge of my surprise when, on turning the house, I found the back door similarly secured. My mind at once reverted to the original theory of thieves, and I blamed myself sharply for my last night's inaction. I examined all the windows on the lower story, but none of them had been tampered with, I tried the padlocks, but they were both secure. It thus became a problem how the thieves, if thieves they were, had managed to enter the house. They must have got, I reasoned, upon the roof of the outhouse where Northamor used to keep his photographic battery, and from thence, either by the window of the study or that of my old bedroom, completed their burglarious entry. I followed what I suppose was their example, and, getting on the roof, tried the shutters of each room. Both were secure, but I was not to be beaten, and, with a little force one of them flew open, grazing, as it had sit the back of my hand. I remember, I put the wound to my mouth, and stood for perhaps half a minute licking it like a dog, and mechanically gazing behind me over the waste links and the sea, and, in that space of time, my eye made note of a large schooner yacht some miles to the northeast. Then I threw up the window and climbed in. I went over the house, and nothing can express my mystification. There was no sign of disorder, but, on the contrary, the rooms were unusually clean and pleasant. I found fires laid, ready for lighting, to three bedrooms prepared with a luxury quite foreign to Northmoor's habits, and with water in the ewers and the beds turned down, a table set for three in the dining room, and an ample supply of cold meats, game, and vegetables on the pantry shelves. Though guests expected, that was plain, but why guests when Northmore hated society? And, above all, why was the house thus stealthily prepared at dead of night? And why were the shutters closed and the doors padlocked? I faced all traces of my visit, and came forth from the window feeling sobered and concerned. The schooner yacht was still in the same place, and it flashed for a moment through my mind that this might be the Red Earl, bringing the owner of the pavilion and his guests. But the vessel's head was set the other way.